Hello and welcome to episode 27 of Generation GC, I Just Want to Live with Travis Huddleston. Last week, we talked about wondering from The Young and the Hopeless. This week, we're talking about I Just Want to Live from the Chronicles of Life and Death. And next week, we'll be back with a song from Good Morning Revival. Travis was born in Morocco and says that he was dropped on his head at less than a year old. He grew up in Massachusetts and Rhode Island, went to college in Colorado, and moved to New York City to be a drummer at age 22. He started playing drums at eight after seeing the Beatles on Ed Sullivan. And he got to do some pretty cool stuff in music, including MTV and being on the radio in New York on what was then a cool radio station, WNEW with Meg Griffin. He doesn't make a living with music, but it is a huge part of his life and says that he is blessed that it is a major thing for each of his kids in all different ways. And now if you're thinking to yourself, wow, Molly, his last name is the same as yours. What a funny coincidence. Huddleston is not really a very common last name. Why might that be that you have the same last name? Well, that is because Travis Huddleston is my dad. Yes, that's right, folks. My dad is the guest on the show this week. We're going to have a great conversation for you. I think you'll really enjoy it. Uh, so I'm very excited for you all to listen. But before we get into the episode, time for my little soapbox moment. First, please visit antisemitism.card.co and blacklivesmatters.card.co to learn more about antisemitism and the Black Lives Matter movement, respectively. We need to continue speaking out against all forms of injustice. I am also going to include in the show notes the petition to save the USPS, which is still in danger. And as you all probably unfortunately know by now, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg has just recently passed away at the age of 87 from the complications of pancreatic cancer. RBG was a pioneer in women's rights and equality. Um, We're now less than two months from the election and there is a seat open on the court. As of Saturday, September 19th, as I'm recording this, it's not entirely clear to me exactly what will happen, whether they will replace her or just leave that seat open, but a lot of people are concerned that a new conservative justice could be appointed, like, soon, you know, by by President Trump before the election in November, uh, and that would obviously have very real ramifications for the justice system. If you are in the U.S., please, please register to vote and make sure you do vote come November or vote early if you are able to do that. Finally, Generation GC stickers are here. Do you want a sticker? Two things you can do. Number one, support the show on Anchor. That helps me sustain the show and have the right equipment to do it, such as headphones, microphones, etc. Also helps me do things like print stickers and get them mailed to y'all. Or number two, you could donate to a charitable organization. Go to blacklivesmatters.card.co. There's a list of places you can donate there. So you're going to send me a screenshot of either your support of the show at anchor.fm slash generation GC pod or of your donation and send me your mailing address. You can DM me on Twitter or Instagram at generation GC pod pod or email generation GC pod at gmail.com and I will mail you stickers. I'll also occasionally tweet or post on the Instagram story about other ways y'all can get some stickers, whether that's good deeds you can do or ways to help spread the word about the show, so please make sure you're following. That's about it for our intro. Thank you all for tuning in, and now on to our episode. So, yeah, I Just Want to Live is track five on the Chronicles of Life and Death. Good Charlotte's 2004 release, their third album. Track four is Walk Away, Maybe, and track six is Ghost of You. This song was a single. I had always thought that it came out as a single before the album, but per my research, apparently it was after the album came out that this was a single. Um, I don't know if it had any kind of play or release before the album. I I feel like it did. In my memory, it did, but I might be totally wrong. It did chart in several countries around the world, uh, number 12 in Australia, number nine in Italy. In the Netherlands, it was number nine on the top 40 and number six on the singles top 40. It was also number nine in Scotland, number nine on the UK singles chart, and number one on UK rock and metal and number 18 in the mainstream top 40 in the U.S. Now, while we're talking about how this song has charted in the U.S., 
should probably mention that it was one of the songs that Sony paid radio stations to play in the 2005 payola scandal. A quote from an MTV article in which Sony BMG apologized for the scandal, it talked about how a lot of this illegal solicitation came in the form of quote-unquote spin programs, which was airplay under the guise of advertising meant that listeners were sometimes unaware that a spin was purchased, and monitoring services can't differentiate between purchase spins and regular spins, so it inflated chart positions. I don't necessarily want to fault the band, because I, it, it, this feels like such a corporate thing, um, so I have no idea to what extent they even knew that this was going on at the time, you know, before it, uh, before it all blew up publicly. But I will have to say there is kind of an irony that, like, out of all songs that this song, which kind of talks about fame and such, that this song was, uh, a payola song. Um, it was certified gold in Australia and the U.S., and it is a, it's a mainstay in their live sets. If you've seen Good Charlotte, Pretty much any time since Chronicles came out, they've probably played it. So, Dad, <laughs> um, when did you first hear Good Charlotte? And, like, what did you first think of them? Like, did you have any idea who they were before I was, like, telling you about them? You know, it's, it's hard to, to remember, honestly, because you did start with them pretty young. Yeah. Um, and so I don't know if I did. Um, I, it's hard, I can't, I can't separate your being into them with, if I knew anything else about them, but especially because that probably wasn't like where I was focused musically at the time. It probably right. was from you. Probably was from Right. You. Right. And you, you know, speaking of songs that are mainstays in their live sets, you have seen Good Charlotte twice. Yeah. 2005 yeah. in Philly with Simple Plan and then 2006 at the Starland Ballroom. Yep. What were those shows like for you as uh, not only and someone who uh, accompanied me to the concert, but someone who, you know, probably paid for the tickets and all of the mm -hmm. t-shirts I bought? I, um, so I enjoyed doing the shows. I mean, it, it was a really fun thing. If you remember the first one, it was raining. Oh, I remember. We went with uh, your friend, Emily. Yeah. And you had just gone to your like intro day at, uh, at, North Academy where you're going to be going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, you would have happily given that up just to go to the show. I, um, I wanted to give that up to go to the I show. I know yeah. you did. You did. Um, and I remember you were very nervous with the traffic and everything. But we got there in time. It was all good. Um, it, was, it was a long drive on the way home after the show. <laughs> I'll say that. Yeah. Felt like. yeah. Didn't you get pulled over? It, right when we were by our house. Yeah, like literally within within a half a mile of our house. Yeah, and he was very nice about it, though. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, I could say more about the shows, though. Do you remember, I think they switched drummers in between those two, right? Because I'm pretty sure Dean yes. Butterworth was the guy for the second. Yeah, Dean Butterworth would have been the guy for the second. Yeah, and he was not for the first, though. It was the other one. I also remember a couple things about the show. I remember Simple Plan had this set. Everything was red. Yes. And it was pretty cool looking. And then Good Charlotte set was really cool. It looked like some graveyard out of Edgar Allan Poe. And Full had, disclosure, like, I have zero memory of Good Charlotte's, like, physical set and backdrop. I remember yeah. Simple Plans, like, red with the black very well, pretty well. I have yeah. zero memory of Good Charlotte's, well, like, what their set looked like. Zero. Yeah, so Good Charlotte's, um, actually, it was really cool. There was this, like, it, it was kind of like it was a graveyard, and it had yeah. above like an arch that said abandoned hope which is from abandoned hope all you enter here right and so it was this very gothic kind yes. of thing yes. um and they were all in black except who's the guy joel um, joel probably wore all white uh he may have i'm not positive about that but i know that also the other the other guy who played both guitar and keys i can't remember billy billy had this black and white striped long coat that was very cool. And he yeah, did a lot of spinning right. around while he played. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. But um but it was fun. And it, you know, it was uh, I, I thought the band, you know, like they were they were tight band both times. Um I liked I thought that, you know, you asked about drummers at one point. Um 
I think the Dean Butterworth is just a much more solid drummer, but the band sounded good both times. Yeah. Dean, I mean, let's let's talk about Good Charlotte's drummers. So listeners, so my dad is a drummer, as you know, you heard in the intro. Good Charlotte in their first few albums had kind of a revolving uh, set of drummers. Dean Butterworth has been the drummer since I believe about 2005. But their first album, so 1996 to about 2000, 2001, they had Aaron Escalopio, who was their original drummer from high school. Josh Fries played on The Young and the Hopeless. I don't think he toured with them, though. He's a studio guy. Yeah, yeah. he's a studio guy. Um, Chris Wilson was the drummer on this album, and I think he was the drummer when we saw them the first time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And then since then, they've had Dean Butterworth. So I think... You know, they found Dean, and they're like, "All right, this guy, he yeah. he fits his his style. It works." I want to know, like, from your perspective as a drummer, what was different about Dean Butterworth's playing? Well, I mean, more like the stuff Josh Freese did. He's just you can just tell he's a very solid, right? He, it's just there. Now, honestly, though, I would take nothing away from the first guy. I thought he sounded great with the band, and. And, you know, it's kind of the classic thing that happens with so many bands that when they, you know, they start getting serious, they get rid of the drummer because the guy's probably not get that good in the studio. And it's hard to take them a lot longer. Why is it that, like, so often it's the drummer that bands um, have, like, yeah. an issue with? Yeah. So, first of all, drummers tend to sort of be a part. Right? It's sort of their own thing. Right. But it's also in recording. Um, a lot of it, a lot of times, it's, you've got to play to a click. Um, and if the drum part isn't solid, then nothing else works. And you have to, most bands, the way they do it is you get the drums right first. And if you're sitting around waiting for the drummer and you can't get the tracks done, it's, it's time, it's money, it's frustration. And so, you know, a lot of times they end up going with a pro as they did when they got Josh Friesen, who, you know, played with a billion people. In fact, I saw him, I saw him playing with Sting. So if that'll give you an idea of his, um, but, but, you know, so you get a studio guy like that, they can always cut it. It's just, you know, done in no time. And then you do the rest of the band. Um, and, and so with Dean, and I also have, I did a little research on Dean Butterworth and re, uh, realized he played on my favorite Morrissey album. Um, he's just a great player. Yeah. Um, solid, but he has a lot of personality in his playing too, I think. And um, so that's probably why the band stuck with him for so long, because he could cut it in the studio, but he also brought something to the table. You know, he wasn't just... Right. I mean, and, and he has to bring something to the table and work well in the studio, but also has to gel live in order well, to... Uh, well, A, you know, it's funny. There was a, there's a movie that I saw. It's a documentary, and it's called, I think it's called Guns or Hired Guns. And it's about, like, the people that get hired by, you know, any band. Alice Cooper was one guy that's interviewed, a bunch of other people. And it's like they have to have three things, right? They have to be able to play, like, that's number one. Like, that's just... Right. Forget it. If they can't, if they can't do everything without a lot of work, forget it. They're out. So to be in that elite group, you're going to be good at your instrument. Um, two, you have to be dependable. Like you know, i.e., no drug problems. You know, you're not a whatever. You know, you just somebody that's going to show up because nobody wants to hire somebody that they have to worry about. Right. And then three, it's just the vibe. Right. You know, it's and you're gonna you're gonna have to be you're gonna be on the road with this guy or girl and you know, you got to be able to get along with them. Yeah. And, and I guess there's four because they're sort of, do they, you know, what are they like on stage? Do they bring something? Is there a personality there? And, For uh, sure. You know, so I think, I think those are the main things. Yeah. 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 So I want to go back in time a little bit. So you had, you know, grown up in New England mostly mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. then went to college out in Colorado, moved to New York after graduation. Um, so I'm 28, almost 29. What yep. kind of music, like, what were you listening to when you were my age? So that's really interesting. So 20, I was trying to think about that. So 28, 29, um, I had moved. So I'd grown up and I, you know, like everybody else, you know, the Beatles and the Who and all that stuff. But then I really got into like jazz and fusion and all that stuff in high school. And I kind of was back and forth between rock and roll and that. And it's funny because of the people I played with in high school, uh, one of them went on and is still playing with Tony Bennett, right. <laughs> the bass player. And the other one is has been touring with Foreigner for about five years. I played with Aerosmith before that. So I kind of had these two different directions, right? Um, 
but anyway, so then I moved to New York and I sort of got full on converted to this sort of, you know, stripped down new wave thing. It's totally changed everything for me. I, I, I never, I never thought before about simplifying really. And so that was, that was really a good, a good thing, lesson for me. Um, but that was like, you know, 22. And, and really I would say up through, you know, 28, I was, that was right when I met your mom. Uh, mm -hmm. so right around that time, um, I was still into, I would say, singer songwriters, alternative, but I always had, I always had this other passion for like Prague and I still do, you know, so, so I always like listen to Yes and, and all that kind of crazy stuff. Um, yeah. But yeah, I would say mostly at that time it would have been like maybe REM, DBs, uh, Marshall Crenshaw. I'm just thinking of someone off the top of my head. Um, sure. Yeah, let's think. Marshall Crenshaw. Um, oh yeah, of course. You you two had come out, you know, not that long before, and I saw their. I think it was their probably their third tour in the U.S. at an outside concert, a really cool place called. Uh, it was on the pier. Concerts on the pier in New York. It was on the west side, and it was outside, right by where that uh, Battleship Museum is now. And um, that was a really incredible show. It's just like you know, Bono was just like amazing and nuts and literally climbing the sound towers and all this crazy stuff. Um, so they made a big impression. And uh, I also want to have to mention, because I've listened to them for my whole life, is King Crimson. I was always into them. And um, as, as mom fondly refers to them, those atonal white guys. <laughs> well, um, I can't disagree, frankly. <laughs> I know a lot of people can't, but as you know, your brother Luke and I um, have a big thing for them. I've seen them many times. And yeah, I know. Interesting experimental stuff. But so, yeah, it was more, oh, and obviously, you know, always Todd Rundgren through everything, through everything from high school, you know, through every time I never, I never didn't get into Todd. I've seen him a bunch of times and he was a big, big thing when I was making, you know, I used to make mixtapes. I'm sure now you do playlists. Yeah, but, playlists um, is the thing now. I used to make mixtapes for mom. And there was always a bunch of Todd on. Very cool. So, yeah. I mean, I know that you've been playing drums mm -hmm. like pretty much your whole life and yep. I kind of know the story of like when, but why drums specifically? Like why, why of all instruments? Like, did you just mm. have it out for your parents? You were just like, I want to pick the most annoying thing to play. Honestly, I have to say it was one of those things. There was not a question in my mind. It was absolutely, I saw the Beatles, literally it was, you know, how many people said the same thing, right? I saw the Beatles and it was Ringo that I wanted. It, it wasn't one of the other ones. It was Ringo. And, um, and then just a little bit later than that, uh, I remember seeing The Who on um, the um, Smothers Brothers show. And that show was actually pretty funny because I learned later, Keith Moon, the drummer, was just a, a maniac, right? And he always had these huge drum sets before anybody else did. So that was like really kind of cool. And he would play jokes on people. And one of his things was he had like a lot of explosives. <laughs> and he got it set up so that when their flash pops were supposed to go off, the one right by Pete Townsend was way, way overloaded. And Townsend says that is when he lost the hearing in one ear. Oh my <laughs> that God. Night. Um, but he was a nut. Like Moon would do stuff. He had at one point, he had a clear drum kit and he had goldfish in water in the floor. <laughs> that sounds cruel. Like that sounds well, very you know cruel. Thinking about that, it is cruel. But people didn't, I didn't, I don't think he did at that time, think of that part. It was just what a funny thing to have goldfish inside a drum, right? Um, yeah, he just did nutty stuff. And so even though in many ways he was not what Benny would call a good drummer, he was very sloppy. His time wasn't that great, but, but he just brought a personality to it in the way that like Buddy Richard or Gene Griffith did you know, before that, that, that was undeniable. So anyway, but to your question, I don't know. I saw a drummer. That's <laughs> what I was going to do. And that's what I did. Sure. So I didn't even realize that like your interest in jazz and fusion had gone back so far. And yeah. that's kind of what you've been doing in yep. recent years in your group, yep. Equinox. So yep. can you talk a little bit about Equinox and the role that music plays in your life now? Yeah. So that's a really nice question. Um, yeah, I really lucked into it. Um, I'm, I'm kind of a weird hybrid. I don't know what kind of drummer people say, what kind of music do you play? And I'm like, I don't know, you know, when you're as old as me and you've been doing it this long, you probably played almost everything. I mean, I played classical music when I was in college in the symphony. It was a great way to make money. Um, but um, 
you know, I think it's, it's uh, and I played, as you know, Maul, I, I played in, uh, in rock bands for years. And even, yep. you know, as, as an adult and a dad, I was still in a pretty good band for a long time. Um, but when I was just looking around, um, I fell into this thing and it's really fun. It's like, it's, um, it's a weird hybrid of, you know, we have a very Latin percussion, you know, yeah. percussionists. And uh, our guitarist really was a blues player for most of his life, but, but all he does, literally, he's a teacher, but every, every waking hour still at his age, and he's close to my age, all he does is play guitar. That's all he does. Wow. And so he can play almost anything. So he wanted to get into this stuff, um, you know, this sort of Latin jazzy stuff. And, and it's kind of evolved. You know, we started out playing covers of, of jazz things and doing them a little bit more Latin. But I'm, let's let's just get it straight. Being a Latin drummer is the hardest thing on earth, as far as I'm concerned. It's much more difficult than rock or jazz. So I'm a very fakey Latin drummer. <laughs> um, but it, it tends to work because it's kind of somewhere between rock and jazz and Latin or whatever. And um, it's just it's just a fun thing to get to do. And as we've evolved now, we're playing really all of our own music, or we might play a cover for fun now, but but we really play our own stuff. And that's just, you know, we've kind of, it's been about five years and we've kind of developed a personality yeah. based on who's, who's in the band. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to dive into, I just want to live. Um, okay. I, so, I mean, I came up for this show and I thought it would be fun to have you on. Uh, and I'll share in a second why I picked this song, but first I want to know what sticks out for you about, I just want to live. So it's interesting because while you had listened to Good Charlotte, you know, from the first album pretty much, uh, or maybe I think you might have come in on the second album. Yeah, I came in on the second album, and then a few months later I bought the first album. So typical. I've done that with, like, so many bands in my yeah. life, so many. But um, at any rate, because, they, you know, the one that sells more, you get that. And then you right, right. What this about. So, um so I had heard them before, but that song was obviously, you know, really big. Yeah. And I mean, you, you definitely were privy to a lot of, you know, me using your stereo system to mm -hmm. play their albums on repeat. Yeah. And in the car and wherever. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and at that time, it was in some ways more so because nobody, was, you weren't really walking around with headphones in your eye, you know, on your phone. It was more right. like you put on the car, um, which was good because I got to hear what you're into. Yeah. Um, so that song, it's in, I, I listened to it again, obviously, when we were going to do this show. And um, to me, it, it's, it stands out on that album. I think I mentioned that to you already. It, it stands out in that I was thinking about it rhythmically. And um, it's much more kind of solid, almost you, can, you could call it more of a dance song in some ways. Mm -hmm. Because, and if you think of the other songs, a lot of their other songs, especially in the first, you know, few records, three records, they're very sort of forward moving, right? The, 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 yeah. The, the, right? And that one is much more dun, 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 dun. dun. Yeah. No, it's a very like it's, solid. It's yeah. a prequel to it. I mean, we'll, we'll get into this more in a second, but it's definitely like a sign of what they're mm -hmm. going to head into on the next yeah. album after Yes, this. yes. And also the production, and it's got the strings on it, right? And the falsetto vocals and all that stuff, which... You know, it's interesting. I mean, I don't know if it was con if it was thought of as a way to do this, but it clearly made it stand out more, and it made it much more of a radio song, right? Um, which, which you know, good for them was a good move. Um, but it, but uh, it's funny. I, I don't know if you want to talk about the video yet because I watched that. Yeah, recently. we'll go into the video in a bit. Yeah. Okay. So without getting into the video, um, you know, the feel is different. There's certain elements that I hadn't. I don't think they had used before or used as much before. Um, and obviously it's a comment on kind of where they were. Um, yeah. You know, at that, at the time, but as noted, the video brings some different stuff in, which I'd love to talk about. When yes. Know. Yeah. We'll, we'll get, well, we will get to the video. Okay. Um, so I will share that I picked this song for you because I just have this memory of being like 13 and you know you had bought this album for me um it came out the day of my bat mitzvah rehearsal on a tuesday because albums came out on tuesdays then and you know after hearing it many times in the house and in the car you i just have this very vivid memory of you singing the falsetto part in the chorus <laughs> and being like 
and, and like not being able to decide if I was like so incredibly embarrassed or if I was like, oh, this is awesome. My dad knows the words to a good Charlotte song. <laughs> um, so just having that, uh, that pretty vivid memory, I, I had to pick this. I have to share one thing with you that that brings up. And sure. it's not really that you are a good Charlotte, except peripherally, but it's, it's pretty similar. So your mom and I were driving, and I don't even know if we were married yet at that time. But we were, we were, doing, um, we were uh, driving somewhere for a weekend, and we had Aretha Franklin on, who you know, I think is one of the all-time most amazing singers ever. You know, I could tear up. She's so amazing. But um, um, the song Natural Woman came on. It's actually written by Carol King, as you probably know. But um, it goes to that really high part. You make me feel. And I sang along with it. And mom was just like very happy that I could, she was with a guy that could sing that line in a falsetto and not be like making fun. Of <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. Anyway, so maybe, maybe I have a thing about falsetto. I don't know. Yeah. Even so, though I can't sing it very well. <laughs> uh, so I want to know what you think this song is about. Um, so in some, you know, I think on the surface, it's pretty much, it's, it's not, you know, it's pretty apparent that it's like, you know, we're at this different point now, right? People, right. you know, I, I, I used to be the underdog and, you know, you see a lot, it's happened, happened with Bruce Springsteen. You know, you're, you're the young, you know, hungry person and railing about the establishment or the, the music industry or whatever, and then you become part of it. And right. look, Tom Petty had that, the last DJ, he had a whole album about that. You know, it's, it's a very, it's something that anybody who, who's fortunate enough to make that transition, which frankly, everybody who wants to. Right. But once you make that, how do you deal with that? And I think it was very, you know, on that level, it was very much about that. Um, yeah. And, and, and also just like any, any kind of good song, I think it comes from a, a very raw emotion and, and a very specific, um, you know, focused feeling. And, you know, I, I think it's, I just want to live. Like, you know, just leave me alone. I don't right. really want to think about this other stuff. I'm here, okay? <laughs> and you could go deeper and, or broader maybe and say, look, everybody has stuff like that in their lives. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't invalidate my emotions or my lyrics or anything. It's just, that's where we are. But, you know, I really don't want to spend my time on it. So. Totally. Yeah. I mean, exactly. I think it's, it's exactly that is, you know, it's, they put out this first album and the first album, like, didn't do that great, kind of underperformed. They put out The Young and the Hopeless, it blows up, and all of a sudden, they are, you know, they they are what they sang about on Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, right? right. You know, they're living the life that they used to kind of make fun of, mm -hmm. and now they're kind of like, oh, there's like a dark side to this too. Maybe we didn't think about that. Um, just leave me alone. Like, I'm, I'm. I'm just me. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Right. Let me ask you a question because this yeah. occurred. I was something. I know they were they were VJs on MTV. Yeah. When did that start, and how long did it go? You know, I'm not exactly sure how long it went, but it was like kind of like right after the Young and the Hopeless came out to like okay. around when this was out. So it was okay. So it was it was after they they were already established. They had already put out a couple, one or two records before yeah. they were VJs. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah, I think this song, it has, it definitely has some self-awareness. They're literally quoting themselves, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, your first hit, Aren't You Ashamed? Yeah. Of yeah. the life you're living. Um, and I think on that note, that kind of self-awareness and talking about their uh, fame, per se, you know, this was the first album that they wrote after being famous right mm -hmm. like they were still nobodies when they wrote the young and the hopeless yeah they write this everyone in the world knows who they are um i think this song like you were saying with some of the the dance kind of feel to the beat as well as the content of this song it makes it like a very clear prequel to the next album good morning revival which is all about i mean it's like a dance record and then it's all about being just super miserable in hollywood and los angeles and seeing all these fake people around you and realizing how unhappy everyone is 
which is kind of full circle, though, if you yes. think about it, because it's yes. about the first record was about being miserable in a different way. Yes, exactly. I I love Good Morning Revival. I think it's a very cynical record. I don't think this song. I don't think I just want to live is nearly as cynical. Because they're no, they're like I wouldn't say so. Yeah, just leave me alone. You know, the album as a whole gets pretty dark at points. Yeah, but this this song is like kind of funny. Like they're still at the mm -hmm. point where it's like, okay, you know, all right, uh, people are want to know every detail about my life, and people are you know, everyone knows who I am and people want to take pictures and people want to meet me, but okay, whatever, just leave me alone, you know? Yeah. You know what I, yeah. Um, okay. I keep thinking of the video, so I'll wait. <laughs> yeah. Um, I wanted to talk about, I found a great interview with Rock Sound, which was like a, a throwback feature. Okay. Um, cause this interview took place in like 2017 and Joel was kind of talking about the transition from the young and the hopeless where they're playing 350 shows a year right. and like almost immediately going right into the studio for this record. And he yeah. talks about how the album, <laughs> how the label wanted this big, bright, marketable caricature of what they yeah. were selling, this safe yeah. punk thing. Yeah. Um, good Charlotte said no yeah. and went dark and moody i was listening to simple plans self-titled earlier yeah which was like their kind of dark and moody and experimental record and like yeah. you know simple plan did like dark and moody and experimental it didn't work out that record didn't do well they kind of went back to what they were doing yeah but charlotte experiments and they're like all right let's try something else let's try something yeah. else let's try yeah. something else um yeah, and he says that I Just Want to Live sums up the whole experience, uh, that the video is kind of dark and a little bit cynical. Mm -hmm. um, and he just goes on to talk about how they were rebelling against all the music business BS kind of flying around that everyone wants them to go one way. They just said, F that. They just wanted to do... You know, they didn't want to be... He says, we are never going to make an obscure record. I think we have always been pretty pop. But, mm -hmm. you know, he's talking about how they are not about holding up to people's expectations, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. per se. Mm -hmm. So, I want to know, um, and we'll, well, after this, we'll talk about the video, but I want to know, like, to you, is this song sarcastic? Is it jokey? Or is it serious? Well, I mean, I think, like any art it doesn't have to be just one of those things totally right? um you know you can start and, and this then gets sort of into the video too because that take that that presents a certain take on it right mm -hmm. um i think you you know the lyrics were probably written sincerely you know i i but then but even then think about it like that as it goes into the chorus and it goes into that like the the different plays on suit right? Yeah. Like a lawsuit and a white suit and a black suit and birthday suit. Yeah. You know, that, that feels probably more like playful, right? Because yeah. it's not, it, it, you know, it's only, that's the only word I could give to it, right? It's playful. It's just but so. it's almost like sometimes you kind of have to do something that is playful in order to make it easier to deal mm -hmm. with and mm -hmm. process really uncomfortable feelings. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's quite true. And I, but again, I don't know how conscious that is or if it's just, you know. Sure. What's funny about it emotionally, though, is that I do think that chorus is pretty straightforward. Yeah. Um, and But those lead-ins to it kind of set it off as this, like, you know, whether it's maybe just making fun of yourself a little bit, you know? Yeah. Um, or I'm not sure. So let's talk about the music video for I Just Want okay. to so this music video premiered on TRL November 2004 because in 2004, if you were a band of any decent size, you premiered your video on TRL. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, working in the music video industry nowadays, usually it's much more likely that stuff would premiere online first. Mm -hmm. And most campaigns that we do, quite often stuff has uh, been out and we've been pushing it for a few weeks before we can even mm -hmm. get it cleared by Viacom. Um, mm -hmm. But sometimes stuff gets gets picked up 
pretty early and it's like maybe not even official yet, but they're like, okay, yep, yep, we'll, we'll take it. Mm -hmm. um, but in 2004, obviously that was pre-YouTube. I think this video is great. Uh, you know, they're, they're all dressed up in food costumes. They are the food group. <laughs> um, Joel is a piece of pizza. Benji is corn. Or no, Benji is pizza. Joel is <laughs> no. <laughs> Paul is a burger. Billy is a strawberry. And Chris Wilson, the drummer at the time, is a carrot. Uh, and they have a CD, all you, like the letter you can eat. And I noticed that it was Epicurious Records, mm -hmm. which was funny. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, basically, the food group gets famous. First, it's good. Parties, limos, they dance with hot girls. There's a really funny scene where Billy in his strawberry costume is just holding this little little cat and like stroking the cat. And I think that's hilarious. Mm -hmm. And then it gets bad, you know? There's tabloids and people are saying stuff about them and it's not going so well. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to know, I, I think the video is so funny. I think they're very clearly uh, making fun of themselves, but I want to know like your your thoughts, your takes well, on it. Yeah, that's I tell you, I found it interesting because the beginning is them as them, right? That little thing, right. thank you, Marilyn. Nobody's in the, in the hall, whatever. And then, but it's it's kind of weird because the story of that video is the band gets eyed by the record company. The record company makes them do this caricature, and yeah. they do that, but. I don't think that's it. Is that what happened? Because I don't know. It feels to me like their thing has been more about like, we're not going to do this. Stuff. So, you know? yeah, I mean, I know that with the first record, their label like really wanted them to do to they, they their label wanted to present them with the first record as like very clean cut. Right. Um, and then it was kind of, rebellious in a sense for them to even do the young and the hopeless mm -hmm. which was pretty damn angsty yeah and then you know even even as we were hearing in that interview that joel did with rock sound um that even with this their label wanted to do them to do something that they saw as marketable right mm -hmm. and and what do they do they go dark and they go mm -hmm. super moody they go goth on this album mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so i think there was I don't think they necessarily gave into the pressure, but I do think there was pressure from the album, from from the label to have a certain image in terms of, you know, everything from the songs to the album art to the videos to the right. live show. Right. Yeah, it's it's just weird because I think of them and I don't I, I remember seeing one thing of them as DJs. And I don't know if it was a later clip or actually saw them when they were, you know, doing it. But they seemed like they really did have an image. And how, how much of that was, you know, contrived and how much of that was that they just, that's who they were or whatever. Or who, I don't know, you know. But right. they clearly had it. There was a look, right, that they totally. had. All of them totally. Had. And, and so that probably doesn't happen totally unconsciously. Um, so, yeah, it's just, it's interesting. Um, yeah, but I, so, so it did. And, again, sort of like that song, you know, how much is just straight, serious saying this is what it is and how much is kind of making fun of yourself and how much right. is just playful. I don't know. You know, it's probably all those. Yeah. I think that's so that that leads into the next thing I want to talk about, which is that, you know, some of the fan discourse about this and, and how this album is kind of where people started to split off from good Charlotte. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. maybe they liked the first two uh, and that was kind of it. Mm -hmm. But if they stuck through this album, you know, they're they're still a fan, and definitely if you stuck through Good Morning Revival, like you you definitely are are still a fan. Um, I think that like the strings and the falsetto were kind of weird to people. It does stick out in the album musically. Um, yeah. You know, thematically, lyrically, I feel like it kind of fits. But I, I my hypothesis is that I don't think people can necessarily tell uh, whether, like, how how serious this was, right? Yeah. Like, are they making fun of themselves? Or, like, yeah. are they just complaining, you know? Yeah. Right. And I feel like on Good Morning Revival, it's a little more, ev 
evident that there's elements where they're very clearly making fun of themselves mm -hmm. while also i mean i think good morning bible is like genius uh because it's like they are simultaneously kind of making fun of themselves and everything they've become while also talking about like the very real like mental health and uh personal emotional uh impacts of that it, i don't know i i think also i wonder you know it's the, the things that I'm able to have insight into as someone who's 28 and, you know, now makes a living in music and has spent almost a decade writing about music, I probably have more insight than, that definitely than I did at that time, and then more insight than I think a lot of fans did at that time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I couldn't necessarily articulate when I was 13 that you know, oh, the the level of sarcasm or making fun of themselves or how self awareness. Like I was like, okay, I just I just like it. But you know, <laughs> I'll give you an analogy, and, and we don't have to go there if you don't want to. But when I was in second grade, my absolute favorite TV show was Batman, uh -huh. and we watched it absolutely seriously, and we took it, you know, word for word. It was exciting and cool, but realistically. The show was a complete parody. It was it was it was live action, but it looked like a comic book. And when somebody hit somebody, you'd say "bam!" like in big letters. Right. It was it was clearly intended as a joke. It was not serious, but we saw it. We thought it was great, right? right? And so, and it worked on both levels. I mean, I remember seeing there was this band I used to really like, the Rainmakers, and they had toured. They never really made it, but they were they were. Yeah, a bunch of us were pretty into them because my friend Claude was working at Polygram and they were really trying to push him. And, um, and we loved him. Great songwriting. I won't go on about it. But when we saw him play once, he was, he, they had just opened for Big Country. They toured with them. And Big Country was huge at the time. Mm -hmm. And I remember he had a guitar pick and he said, this is from Stuart Anderson. He threw it out in the crowd. And I said to Claude, I don't think people know that he's being sarcastic about that. He said, yeah. it doesn't matter. <laughs> and I think that's really true, right? Like to some degree, you probably do become a bit of a parody of yourself, and totally, you, you got to be able to live with it. So, yeah. so you kind of do it, and and a lot of stuff, you know, any band, there's stuff that works on, especially a band that does well in rock and roll or pop. There's stuff that works on stage, and you probably do it almost every night because it works. Um, and the first time you did it, maybe it was just for the moment, but the next time, it's not just for the moment. And yet you still do right, it because right? Right. you're a performer. So, yeah. So, no, I think, I mean, that's a, that's a great point. Um, I want to talk about some fan comments on this song and video. Because I, I really enjoy kind of seeing what other people have had to say. Uh, so we're going to go to YouTube comments on the video first. Uh, I saw several comments from recent months surrounding coronavirus i think my favorite is from philippe three weeks ago who said covid 19 times i just want to live um <laughs> real chris 10 four months ago said song against coronavirus i just want to live so um yeah. you know i don't think it's what they wrote the song about but if people can get that meaning that's great yeah um user billy very recently said i always thought it was ironic how these guys got famous for making fun of celebrities that complain about how difficult their lives are and then they make a song that is completely dedicated to complaining about the trials and tribulations quote unquote of fame with like an eye roll and face palm mm -hmm. emoji there um that's you know a lot of people were were thinking the same thing um and the last youtube comment we're gonna read just because i thought this was really funny from Pietro, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, about a month ago, says, my dad was listening to this song and asked me if it was Young Thug. That's fine. Um, yeah. Um, I also found a bunch of comments on songmeanings.com. I love reading the comments on songmeanings.com because that's like the most, it, it's geniuses, it's the, the, it predates Genius, and it is so much more chaotic than Genius.com. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people on songmeanings.com are just, oh, they're, they are harsh. They are 
go going into them for this song you know how how are they writing about this they're complaining about having no privacy they should be flattered by the attention um lots lots of comments like that but one funny comment um from user Beat Bastards in October 2004 said, they're probably just complaining about how their moms only gave them $30 instead of $50 to go to the Hot Topic. <laughs> so, you know, gotta dig to find the gems. I had to dig yeah. through a lot of comments to find the gems. Yeah. I, I, I like the Brass Knuckles comment, actually. Yeah, yeah. Well, and they, they'll sing about Brass Knuckles on the next album, so, you know. Yeah. I want to talk about a little bit of critical discourse, which, by the way, since they talk about an interview in this song, mm -hmm. anytime I tried to Google, could Charlotte, I just want to live, interview, it just got me the song lyrics. It so, was hard. Yeah, I don't know if they were interviewed by Rolling Stone. Mm -hmm. um, there was an interview, Rolling Stone, there was a big piece on Rolling Stone in 2003, mm -hmm. Good Charlotte, The Polite Punks. It's a great piece. Uh -huh. Like, it's it, it very much speaks to like their character um it's it's online i've like talked about that piece before i think it's great so i don't know if that is the interview he is referring to i don't know if there was like another interview or right. or maybe with rolling stone or maybe he's just like pulling the name rolling stone out of his yeah. ass you know but they were interviewed by rolling stone mm -hmm. cool so in terms of critical response, though, <laughs> allmusic.com compared Joel's rapping on this track to Nelly. Uh, they say it's a punchy blend of power chords, string samples, and disco beats that features modern rapping in a Nelly-inspired flow. Uh, they say that this feels like the centerpiece of the album since it's spiked with rock power but gets its soul from the pop life they lead. I mean, I can't really speak to... Uh, just sounds how like much. a music critic to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it sounds like a music critic. Uh, I I can't really speak to just how much he sounds like Nelly or if he was, like, pulling from Nelly, but who knows? Yeah. Um, Consequence of Sound did not dig it. And, like, you know, Consequence of Sound, I think, is a website that I would be shocked if they, like, genuinely praised Good Charlotte because that's the site that uh, is not known for being nice to bands like Good Charlotte, right? And it's kind of like, literally, they wrote, it was this whole article about this song and video, basically talking about how bad it is. And it was an article that came out in 2010. And so I'm very curious, like, why in 2010 are you writing about how bad something is, right? Yeah. Like, are you writing yeah. about how bad something is that was six years ago? Because it's yeah. not like the album just came out and you're writing a bad review. Right. It's not like the album came out 10 years ago and you're talking about how significant it was. Like, you're literally just talking about how bad it is. It's, it's, like, obviously I'm very biased. But I try to differentiate between, like, when are people saying things that I frankly think are incorrect versus when are they saying things that like might be correct. They just like have a stick up their butt, you know? But you know, what's funny. I, I feel like all of us, and especially when it comes to rock and roll and this music that, that we all have these emotional ties to. Yeah. It's really difficult to not, sort of judge people in light of their personality too. Like in some ways it's music. It doesn't matter why, you know what I mean? Like, it's kind of like when you look at art, you know, should you get a lot of history of the painting or should you look at the painting? Yeah. And, and I mean, they're, I mean, they're all valid approaches, I think. But anyway, I mean, for me, for me, like hearing and learning what I have learned about the personality of Good Charlotte mm -hmm. and the, the members of Good Charlotte has only helped me loving and caring about this band so much for so many years mm -hmm. but i loved the band before i ever read a single interview right, right. you right. know i i had the young and the hopeless on repeat and knew all the words before i knew any of <laughs> i even names. knew all the words without that's true <laughs> that's true you you knew all the words <laughs> but anyway this this consequence of sound article 
talks about how good Charlotte used to be catchy. Um, you know, that some, but then something went wrong when they tried to write pop and, you know, they just kept making music, which like, I think is kind of an incorrect assumption because yeah, this song is kind of poppy, but Chronicles of Life and Death as a whole really is not a pop album. Yeah. Like at all. Yeah. Um, you know, I, it, like, I think a lot of their other criticisms, despite being a person that kind of has an attitude and, you know, I, we talked about this on episode 26 last week on Wondering that, you know, Good, Good Charlotte was often a band that critics or people who liked to, who like highbrow things. Mm-hmm to not necessarily appreciate because Gord Charlotte is not like a highbrow band. Right. Um, but anyway, in talking about the video, they say that this could be Good Charlotte poking fun of themselves, but it's probably unintentional. I think it's very intentional, personally. I think it's extremely intentional. Yeah, yeah, I think you're probably right. I, honestly, I think you're probably right about that. Yeah. I agree. I did want to mention that there was a remix of this song on Greatest Remixes in 2008. Yeah. Uh, by Teddy Riley. I don't want to even go too into it because I'm I'm not a big fan. I mean, I I have more appreciation for greatest remixes now than I did in 2008, but I still really don't do not like it very much. You know, the whole remix thing is really interesting, and it's it's even more interesting. Some people, like Frank Zappa, at one point released remixes of some of his early records and yeah. and changed them completely, like put in these kind of bass heavy disco not disco but but you know much more um groove tracks yeah and it was just weird you know and it's kind of like i mean if anybody's got the right to do it he's got it he does but but i don't know i mean and, and that's the whole thing in, in recorded music the art isn't just the music it's the mix and it's all that stuff and so yeah. you're changing the art and is that a valid new piece i don't know maybe you know yeah you're, i mean Greatest Remixes came out, you know, a year and a half after Good Morning Revival did. So I think it was mm -hmm. them just continuing to lean into that dance thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was kind of a weird concept for, like, a quote-unquote punk band to do a yeah. remix album. Yeah. Like, who does that? Yeah. Um, I guess Fall Out Boy has probably done stuff like that. But I think Fall Out Boy has strayed very, very much from punk. Um, it's funny. Um Little Steven, you know, he has that uh, channel Underground Garage on yeah. um, on Sirius. Um, he, he talked about he talks about remixes as the worst thing to ever happen to music. He said it's like it's like they were doing these remixes, of, kind of like this, right? right? Doing remixes of rock bands to be disco bands, so that people would then buy a record which they wouldn't like. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> which I found pretty funny. Yeah. So I want to uh, to start wrapping this up. How okay. has I Just Want to Live held up for you over time? I, you know, it's funny because I hadn't heard it in a long time. And I heard it and I liked it. I mean, uh, you know, it sounded, it sounds good. I mean, the thing for me is um, I've gone through a lot of phases where I'm really into whatever I'm into at the time. But now, as you probably noticed growing up, I, I listen to almost everything. You know, I really do. And so I just heard it like a fresh thing. I, it had been so long, and I didn't bring much to it. And I was like, wow, oh, that's a good song, you know? Um, and it made me listen to it in a different way. So I, I think it's actually held up really well. And I can't think of anything else that sounds exactly like it. Right. And that's, to me, that's the biggest thing, right? Do you sound like, did you did you create something that it, that is itself? And maybe that's too obvious a statement. But I, 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 on those terms, I think it's a really good song. Yeah. Yeah. So... What? <laughs> this is a song you definitely gets a different uh, answer from the people who are, you know, kind of the diehard fans. <laughs> but um, then your dad, <laughs> right? But what has Good Charlotte meant to you, or like, what have you thought about them over the years, and like, how how have your your thoughts on them changed over time? Oh, okay, so I actually, I mean, I'm glad you asked that because for me, um, you getting into them in the first place, yeah, was. You know, I thought it, it was it was so many different kinds of emotions. You know, one of them just being, wow, that's my daughter. Like, whether it was the kind of music I would have liked at the time or not, <laughs> the fact that it was such a big thing for you 
And, well, and wh- whether started- you liked it or not, you were you had plenty of exposure. Yeah. Well, no, but I mean, my point being that that um, the heavy emotional identification with with a band and with songs and yeah. stuff was something that you know obviously was something that's been a big part of my life. So I love that. Um, I love that it. I think it. You know, you had some pretty hard times, and I think that they, you know. On one hand, they tapped into a lot of people like you who did mm-hmm. have those hard totally, times. Totally, totally. On another, on the other hand, though, it was something that gave you so much, you know, solace and yeah. identification, and we all need that, right? So, yeah. so that I think was was great. Um, thinking about them overall, you know, I, I I I I try to take a little bit less of the rock critic approach to bands now and just say kind of yeah. do I like them you know yeah. and um and on that level I think you know look like I say um I know some of the critics sort of said they, uh, they're just they sound like a lot of other things but I don't think that's really true I mean they certainly incorporated things that other people did too yeah um but I think they sound like themselves and especially because they did all these different weird things over the years and you know I give them credit for that yeah I love that well, do you have any last words about I Just Want to Live, about Good Charlotte, or about yourself? Um, well, about myself, there's two things that are important that you didn't point out. So I just have I'll to probably, say one. They'll, one they'll probably I, go in the intro. Oh, okay. Because one was that I was born in Morocco. Yeah. And two is that I was dropped on my head <laughs> and stuck to my skull at, you know, less than a year old. Yeah. So whatever else has happened in life is probably affected at least by the second one. Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, you want to put that on. Okay. Well, yeah. well it's true, right? It is um, true. And I, I, it, and one thing that you, I think you took from me from that too was that I always managed to use that to hold it against my mom, um, in with her. Like I never, it obviously yeah. did yeah. purpose, but I got to, I got to joke with her about that, and you sort of like doing the same thing. Yeah, so, absolutely. I like that. Yeah. So this has been great. Um, I'm doing a Generation GC and Friends playlist where I put, you know, the songs we talk about on the show as well as like a recommendations from my guest. So can you give me a recommendation just of anything you've been listening to lately? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I can. I have to think. And I, I was, I remember seeing this and thinking I should, I should come up with something. But um yeah, you know what? I'm just going to put it out there because I think there's something, even though it's not like punk or especially pop, mm-hmm. there is something that kind of hits the same note in a lot of uh, King Crimson. So I'm just going to say, pick a King Crimson song. Okay. Pick anyone. Doesn't right. matter. All and right. listen to that. Yeah. All right. Um, this has been awesome. Thank you dad uh listeners thank you for tuning in uh to episode 27 of generation gc last week we talked about wondering from the young and the hopeless next week we'll be talking about a song from good morning revival my name is molly i've been your host and please make sure that you follow generation gc at generation gc pod pod on facebook twitter and instagram you can also follow me molly at m huddleson m h u d e l s o n and please subscribe to the show on itunes rate it leave a review and spread the word tell your friends thank you all for tuning in <laughs>